That's why they spoke in paradoxes and riddles, to help you realize how little you know. The more you try to figure it out, the less you'll understand. On the other hand, sometimes it'll come clear to you in a moment. I'm going to tell you a Taoist story now. It comes out of Huai Nanzi. You may have heard a version of this story if you saw Charlie Wilson's War. It shows you what happens to Chinese stories. The story says that a man suddenly found himself the owner of a new horse. His neighbors congratulate him on his good fortune until his son falls from the horse and breaks his leg. The man's, neighbor, the man's neighbors now consult him on his bad fortune until the army conscriptors come along and carry off all the men who were able-bodied, not including the man's son because he was still injured. The lesson of the story is that when an event occurs, we are quick to judge it as fortunate or unfortunate, but our judgments are often mistaken. Taoism is about, essentially, humility, intellectual humility, about not presuming to know what the world is about or even to know your place in it, and a kind of yearning to connect more authentically and more completely with this force. So it's also about spiritual humility. In some ways, it echoes the lesson in the book of Job when Job suffers all those terrible misfortunes and demands that God explain God's self and God says, that's not your problem and it's not your right to know. The Taoist does not seek to know ultimate things but seeks to live inside ultimate reality as authentically and as completely as possible. The way that a Taoist seeks to do this is through something called Wu Wei, which means the path of non-effort. It doesn't mean non-action. It means to let your actions be as close to nature, natural, spontaneous, and unplanned as possible possible, to follow the path of the Tao. In fact, the best image that I heard all week long as I was studying this is water. Anyone ever try to hold back a river, control an ocean? The Taoist point of view says anytime we resist the Tao, we're actually making our lives far worse than they would be. Our task is to find the path that the, the water, the reality is taking, and join it. Now, it can take on rather fantastic forms when we see these stereotypical movies about China. Remember Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and people leaping over rooftops and virtually flying? That's part of the lore the exotic lore, but it's about that sense of belonging to the Tao so thoroughly that one transcends earthly limits. But that's a stereotype. But wasn't it a beautiful movie? And then there was the music by Tan Dun, a great Chinese composer. So when I was in Brooklyn, he came to Brooklyn to perform a piece of his music, to offer a piece called the, it was the St. Matthew Passion but he orchestrated it for orchestra and water. Large bowls of water that were used to make dripping sounds, to pour from place to place. He would hit a gong and submerge the gong and the sound go up and down. And those were integral to the sounds he wanted to make. And I ran into a an interview in which he explains why. Three or four years when, uh, beforehand, when my wife was pregnant, he writes, we went to the doctor for an ultrasound, and there I could see this beautiful baby and hear the heart. Suddenly I heard this beautiful water sound. Does anyone remember hearing the sound of a baby's heart, or even your own with a sound around? It sounds liquid. And I realized, he says, this was the sound all human beings hear first. 
At that time, I'd just gotten the commission for the water passion, and I said, I've got to start with water, he said. It's the beginning, and the beginning is the ending, and the end is the beginning. That's the Tao. Water. And think about it, how often water turns up in all the sacred traditions. Do you remember how the Christian and Jewish Bibles begin? In the beginning, when darkness was upon the face of the deep, the ocean is there beforehand, unformed in the dark. In Exodus, how do the Hebrew children obtain their freedom but by going through the waters, just like a child comes through the waters to be born? Christians talk about baptism as a new birth, literally going through the waters and out again. Muslims, if you go to a mosque anywhere in the Middle East, you stop and wash your hands, your face, and your feet. If you go to a Shinto shrine, you pour water over your hand, and you rinse out your mouth. And Buddhists, they go off to offer bowls of water as offerings to the bodhisattvas. And of course, what is the river Ganges? The holy river to which all Hindus wish to go so they can be, they can die next to it, be cremated and have their ashes enter into the river from which life comes. Water. It's not a Taoist thing, it's a human thing. It is a, a symbol so rich, so deep, so profound, it cannot help but describe our souls and our lives. So basic, so necessary to life, yet also capable of terrific power like three feet of snow in Connecticut. Tsunamis that destroy whole regions, floods. It's not a good thing or a bad thing, it is just the power that we're surrounded by. If there's an intelligible idea of Tao, this must be it. Because you can't fight the water, you can only go along with it. We should just go with the flow. Submit, as a Muslim would say. Relinquish, as a Buddhist would say. Follow the will of God, as a Jew or a Christian would say. But the genius of Taoism, it says, don't give it a name. Don't tell me what it's trying to do. Just accept that it's there. And that you must take part in it. In a sense, they're like the good Quakers I know who say, don't just do something, sit there. But there's the rub, isn't it? We want to know, we want to understand, we want to have a hand in making it all go. And Taoism says, nope, can't do it. You're just a pawn in the hands of larger forces than you understand. We don't like that. We want to be part of the show. We want to be in on it. But Taoism says, nope, you're not even close to in on it. Give up. In fact, they say, when you try to make things better, generally you're mucking it up. Less is more is the original Taoist notion. Don't just do something. Sit there. Yes, indeed. On Thursday, as we watch the snow come down and the cancellations line up, we got a taste of the Tao, didn't we? And I don't mean the Tao going up and the Tao going down. I don't mean that Tao. You know what Tao I mean. When we see how the forces of reality are, in fact, larger than us, when we see the effect that we have individually is so nil, we do feel that sense of its immensity. And then also, we see the effect we have collectively upon the land. We see what we have done to it, despite our puny size. Like ants, we have overwhelmed nature in places and eroded it, perhaps. So I'm asking, yes, does a Taoist just accept everything? If we cannot resist the power of the universe, must we also give up our resistance to the power of human evil? Do we not have moral obligations? I don't know. I just know this is a compelling notion. And every day I see the wisdom of Lao Tzu. I remember what he said that I should attain knowledge by adding things every day, and to attain wisdom I should remove things every day, and I'll be darned if I know which ones to get rid of. Maybe I should get rid of Lao Tzu. Over half a life ago, 
when I was at the University of Chicago, there were a lot of bookstores along 57th Street, and I'll tell you a quick story that brings me to the end of my words this morning. I'm walking down the street, 57th Street, there was a little bookstore and a little book in it that nobody bought. It was a little book by a little professor named Norman McLean. He died in 1990. And in 1992, that little book became a great movie called A River Runs Through It. The movie is quite elegant and touching. And it wisely ends with the words that Norman McLean himself wrote, words worthy of Lao Tzu, but also so deeply felt that they could never be called dispassionate at all. And as I thought about how to end my words this morning, these words by Norman McLean seem to be just about perfect. I first confess that I am not a fly fisherman, but I could almost want to be reading this passage. He writes, Like many fly fishermen in western Montana, where the summer days are almost arctic in length, I often do not start fishing until the cool of the evening. Then in the arctic half-light of the canyon, all existence fades to a being with my soul and memories and the sounds of the big Blackfoot River and a four-count rhythm and the hope that a fish will rise. Eventually, all things merge into one and a river runs through it. We look for those moments in our lives when we are so connected to everything that we can feel the river running through us, which does not relieve us for a moment of our duty to care for the wounded, to uphold the just, to do right and do wisely. But in the end, all things merge into one, and a river runs through it. Amen and amen. I invite you, please, to share these beautiful words for our final hymn this morning. There's a wideness in your mercy, which you will find as number 213. And don't forget your red envelope. As Paul Robeson said, that all that breaks the heart and oppresses the soul will one day give place to peace and understanding, and everyone will be free. And on that day, a day which the Lord has made, all will rejoice and be glad. 